Welcome to this session on business architecture, a new way to view the world, where we will introduce you to the business architecture framework and notably the concept of the business model. Now every company that has been created, grown and thrived has at some point in time begun with an individual, a person reasonably obsessed with a business idea. A famous Swede, Ruben Rousing, the founder of Tetra Pak, for instance, the food packaging company, was obsessed with the idea of making food safe and available everywhere. The famous Jeff Bezos of Amazon wanted to make every book ever written available in your hands within 60 seconds. This man, Henry Ford, in a picture taken in 1903, was obsessed with making cars. He wanted to make a lot of cars. In fact, he wanted to democratize the automobile. Now, we're going to use Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company to help us guide you through the concept of business architecture and the notion of the business model. Now, just having a great business idea, which you are very obsessed with, really isn't enough if you're going to be successful. In order to succeed, you're going to have to take a step back and look at the context in which you're going to try to succeed, the context which we might call the industry. Nowadays, we have very useful models to help us describe industries and the dynamics within industries, and we're going to show you how Ford positioned Ford Motor Company within the automotive industry by introducing you to Michael Porter's Five Forces model. In order to realize a company vision, every company needs to find its competitive position. And the best way of finding out what and where that competitive position is, is by using the Five Forces model. The Five Forces model is a framework where we understand the dynamics of the ongoing competition. It was developed by Michael Porter in the 70s, so obviously Henry Ford didn't have it at hand when he uh, performed his analysis of the emerging car industry. But he did his analysis really brilliantly. He understood what was going on and he did this analysis in order to position Ford as one of the most successful companies to be. At the time when Ford was founded in 1903, there were already 200 car manufacturers in place and more were coming in there were many who were interested in the evolution of the car industry and they saw an opportunity to enter into that industry. The customers were, of course, a bit reluctant to this new thing of the car. Imagine yourself to be the first one to exchange that horse and carriage for an automobile. They were not easily convinced and Henry Ford did a lot of thinking in how he should convince the customers to be the ones first to park up their car on the driveway instead of that horse and carriage. But there were a number of substitutes that, they had, uh, that Ford had to face. There were trains, of course, there were trams, bikes, people could walk. There were a number of means of transportation that challenged the car. They weren't even in agreement how the car was going to be propelled, whether it was going to be with electric engine or steam engines or the petrol engine, etc. So Ford had to think a lot about also those substitutes and how to develop his thing in such a way that those substitutes were, or that the car were better than those substitutes that were there. And then there was the, the supply side of the situation. Henry Ford wanted to make a lot of cars. He was about to democratize the automobile. He wanted to open the highways to mankind, he realized that he needed to make a lot of cars. Henry Ford was from Detroit and he checked up the, the prerequisites that was in the surroundings and all the workshops in place to see whether he could outsource the manufacturing of the car. Checking up on the available capacity uh, in the workshops in the Detroit area, he figured out that he could make somewhat 75 cars a month and then it would take a very long time to, uh, to accomplish that vision of democratization. So he had to think of another way of going about creating his car. Now the questions you ask yourself 
around these five forces. And the answers you give, or the choices you make relative to these five forces, these are your business strategy. In order to operationalize the strategy, to make it come alive, to give it some traction, you set a business model. The business model is the unique structure that operationalizes a business idea. It's how you realize your business strategy. It says something about what you are going to offer, the value proposition, to whom, the customer segments, how you're going to reach them, the channels, how you're going to keep relationships with them, how you're going to get paid, where the money is going to come from, the revenues. So what, to whom, and then on the left side, how, with what structures, processes, competencies, systems, at what cost are you going to deliver this value proposition in order to be profitable? Now let's have a look at the business model in the context of the choices that Henry Ford made for the Ford Motor Company. Looking at the value proposition, I think you're all familiar with the Ford Model T, which you could have in any color as long as it was black. You've all heard about that. This was his value proposition, hassle-free transportation embodied by the Ford Model T, and there was only one configuration of that model, and it is the third most produced car ever after the Volkswagen Beetle and the Toyota Camry. In fact, it was made in 15 million. That's quite a lot of cars. Now, who was he going to deliver these cars to? He wanted to democratize the automobile. It was no longer something for the elite to purchase. It was for the masses. Obviously, the customer segment that he wanted to turn to was the middle class, the emerging American middle class, and here they are. Now, you're going to sell cars to these people. How are you going to do it? Are you going to have them travel with their horse and carriage to Detroit, sell the carriage, slaughter the horse and drive the car back home? I don't think so. In fact, Henry Ford invented, and this is key, he invented the notion of the dealership. That didn't exist at the time. He invented the idea that he needed to find high-standing, respectable people who these people could trust, someone they would trust to buy a car from, and who would also have enough money to buy a lot of cars from Henry Ford and keep them in his dealership. And in order to make these dealers profitable, Henry Ford also invented the notion of car servicing and warranty programs. You had to bring your car to a service, a service station that, of course, you could get from the dealer and pay for it. And in that way, your warranty would be valid. But what were you going to do when your car was in there being serviced? You didn't have a car. You'd sold your horse and carriage. Well, Mr. Ford invented the rental cars. He started Hertz Motor Company. Completely amazing. And a car did cost quite a bit of money, $950 or so. And that was more than most people had in cash or in their bank account. He invented car financing. So on the right side of the business model, we see Henry Ford do amazing innovations that a lot of people haven't heard about. Now that he knew who he was going to sell it to and how he was going to reach them and maintain the relationship with them, he needed to turn to the left side of the business model. How was he going to produce so many cars at a cost that would allow him to make a profit. And of course, you've all heard about the assembly line, the famous Ford Motor Company mass production model. And it is said that he got inspiration for the assembly line by visiting the meatpacking districts in Chicago, where he saw cows and pigs coming in on one end and steaks coming out on the other end. And he said, well, if we could do that, but just reverse the order, we might be able to make a lot of cars. And mass production was invented. And he took it very far, as you're probably aware of. He invented the notion of vertical integration. He acquired mines. He built rubber plantations. He had full control over the entire supply chain and was able to cost efficiently, drive down the cost of the Ford so that when the last car was sold, it was actually sold at $350 and he was still making a nice profit. This, my friends, is certainly the most copied business model ever. Fast forward from Ford to present days. We're going to look into another industry uh, to exemplify the way we can work and understand business models. This is the ABBA album Arrival 
It was released in October 1976. It contains 12 songs of the quartet of ABBA, which has uh, since sold some 400 million records, making them one of the world's most successful pop band. If you had asked the record company manager back in 1976 whether it's a hard business to run uh, or not, I'm sure that Stickan Andersson, who was the record manager of of Polar Music, which was the, uh, the company behind ABBA, he would definitely answered, it was a pretty easy thing. For as long as you mastered the artist and repertoire process, i.e. finding successful bands like ABBA and providing them with the hit songs. Because at the time, the music industry was protected by a distribution monopoly. The LP, the long play, wasn't very much of something to copy for anyone, even though we could use cassette tapes and, and try to do it, but the sound quality got worse every time you copied it. So they were kind of protected from piracy and these things. And he knew how to position a new group uh, in store so he could make them become the best-selling artist of the time. So he, he really saw if he could find the right artist and the repertoire, it would be no problem. In October 2008, Spotify launched its service. It's a great service. The value proposition is really cool. You could stream pretty much any music that has ever been recorded. You pay uh, a fixed fee a month and you could stream it to pretty much any device. I think it's interesting to ask oneself, why did it take so long for this service to see the daylight? Of course, there had been illegal ones, like Pirate Bay and Napsters and the others. And meanwhile, the music industry were just standing by watching. But why did it take so long for the music industry, or for anyone for that matter, to act upon the possibility of streaming legal music to so many people? The answer, as you already figured out, I guess, lies in the rights issues. When the founders of Spotify, when they founded their company, they had to negotiate some 10,000 individual contracts with rights owners in order to get the jukebox filled up with the 6 million songs that they felt needed in order to make the value proposition compelling to their customers and make us willing to pay. The interesting thing is there was no technology breakthrough that year. It was all about making that value network of rights owners into the business model so that it could fly. The music industry didn't do anything. They just watched these things happen, standing by. First, they did absolutely nothing. Then they started to whine. They started to lobby and try to change the digitization process of the music industry. And finally, they started suing. And they didn't only sue those who violated, they sued also the customers. That is not a very workable way when disruption comes in an industry. Now, music industry has picked up today, but during those years of transformation, there was only one company that really benefited and made money out of that inertia of the music industry's not moving kind of behavior, and that's Apple. Apple launched its iTunes account, and they have sold billions and billions of songs, piece by piece, not only full albums, but piece by piece, and reaped much of that money that the music industry had once created the platform to reap for themselves. And this is interesting. Apple has never been a music company. They have had nothing to do with the music industry. It's a computer manufacturer who came out with a device, the iPod, and they developed the ecosystem again around that iPod so that we could start paying for music and enjoying it. Not streaming that time, but downloading it to our devices. We said that the core competence of the music industry and the record manager's view on what they are really good at was the artist and repertoire. When we see the idle concepts of the, that are all around on the planet, 
we see how that last bastion of the record industry or the music industry, how that is being taken out of them. Because if you think about it, the idol concept where the watchers vote for whom to win is really crowdsourced artist and repertoire. So the big question now is, what is the music industry is going to do with their business model in order to keep up with the digital revolution? We have now introduced the concept of business models. The context for business models is the business architecture. And business models play a very important role in this framework. The business model layer, if you see it that way, kind of connects and help us connect strategy to the supporting structures. By defining our business models, we can define and decide and prioritize what activities need to be performed in order to make sure that we execute on the strategy. So the business model is a concept that we use to bridge the gap, if you like, between strategy and structures. And the more we work with business models, the better the business architecture as a whole will become. So mastering business models is, is the way to go about developing business architectures that are rigged to execute on the decided strategies. The business model is the connection between strategy and execution. And it's a simple model, it's, it's, it's easy to understand and it's easy to start use and apply. But before you do that, I would like to just remark two things. The first thing is that business models don't exist as such. It's a conceptual tool and it's a tool that we use in order to describe and better understand what is going on. So don't believe that the business models are out there for us scientifically to find. We use the business model concept in order to describe and define them and thereby being more precise and better understand what is going on. Secondly, don't ever mistake a revenue model for a business model. Revenue models are a dimension of the business model. Every time we work with business model, we make sure that we cover all the six dimensions of the business model. It's a holistic approach. So we need to have value proposition. We need to have the right-hand side with customers, channels and relations. We need to have left-hand side with processes, competences and structures. And we need to understand the bottom line of the business model, how profits is made by balancing revenue and cost. So the power of the business model is its entirety. You need to cover it all and thereby you will be able to tie strategy to execution.